Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Absolutely Not Podcast. I'm your host, Heather McMahon. How are you? Hope you're doing better than I am. I'll tell you what, I'm fucking jet lagged as shit. Apparently, Taylor Swift said jet lag is, is a choice. That's a, a lie. Um, <laughs> that is a lie, you bitch. Um, we have a lot, lot to dive into today. Um, we're gonna hit the voicemails. I'm gonna give you a recap on on the tail end of the Aussie trip. I need to preface this episode though with I listened to last week's episode, and y'all, I wanted to say this, but I never got the opportunity. I know that that episode was a little unhinged. The guy who was running the studio in Sydney, this guy named Jock, was so unbelievably attractive. I walked in the studio and he took my breath away, okay? Hot, 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 hot. And he then sat in the studio with me the entire time working as the sound engineer and the overall producer for that episode. And I told him multiple times, it's like, oh, don't worry. You can just like press record and, and you know, let me, I'll talk to myself for an hour. Don't worry. I'll tell you when I come back in and, and like press cut. And he's like, no, I want to listen to it. I was like, what the fuck? This guy was sitting you know, uh, four feet from me with headphones on. And I was just sit, and I didn't like come dolled up. I had been running errands that morning. Like I looked like shit. Okay. And that's the other part of now doing video episodes is I then have to worry about like what I look like. Y'all get mad if I wear sunglasses. Some days I do it just cause I'm dead behind the eyes. And then I get comments on YouTube and Instagram. That's like, she looks tired. Cause I am bitch. But I did not show up like fully glammed out, okay? I did not show up to the studio with the fake lashes on, like ready to go. And this very handsome man sat three feet from me. He didn't know who I was. So I got to come in there and razzle dazzle. And then I'm also sweating through my Lululemons and my Patagonia jacket. I had never been so uncomfortable in my life. I'm like, I have to be extra kind of sexy and entertaining. He had a girlfriend. I'm married. Okay. There was no sexual tension. I was just nervous. I hadn't been around somebody that attractive in a minute. And he just sat there and he was like giggling and stuff. I was like, all right, all right, I'm crushing. I'm doing really doing really good but I wanted to preface this and add like guys this episode I my asshole is clenched the entire time because I was so uncomfortable everyone in Australia is good looking everyone and I just did not expect the podcast producer to be a fucking male model oh my god I was sweating I was absolutely sweating so anyways, I'm back in the studio and Tina's sitting four feet from me and that bitch doesn't give a shit. So uh, we are going to really let loose today. I feel like I'm in a safer, less judgmental environment. But uh, oh my God, we have so much to get into. I, the jet lag though. All right. And I hate, I hate that I'm bringing this back up. I downloaded this app called Time Shifter. Everybody told me to do it. And essentially you, you plug in your flight information. It lets you know when you need to have caffeine, when you need to have daylight, what time you need to try to go to sleep to get back on a regular regimen. I don't know what the fuck happened to me. I get on the flight and it's like, all right, you need to sleep from 6 p.m. to like 9 a.m. or whatever. So because we took off at 2 p.m. Australia time, I was like, all right, I'll have a little dinner on the flight and then I will take a trazodone and I'll be knocked out and I'll sleep for like six hours because then I had a layover in L.A. to get back to Atlanta. Well, I take this trazodone and I don't know if it had been nestled up cozy next to an Adderall or some sort of stimulant because I took this bad boy and it usually knocks me out. I was itching. I was scratching my neck, tweaking on this flight. Jeff's over there out like a light and I'm on the time shifter app just panicked. It's like, you must go to sleep. You must be asleep. And originally when you when you log into this app, it's like, are you going to be using melatonin? Now I don't use melatonin because it can fuck with your hormones and I have absolute fucking night terrors on that shit, okay? I wake up in a sweat, screaming, the dogs are barking, like it's it's bad. Trazodone I love, non-habit for me. I get a prescription. I only take it when I really need to get some Z's. If you know anything about me, you know my cortisol is high. That's why I'm so energetic. But I'm really a little sleepy kitty cat who doesn't know how to turn the brain off. So when I was logging into this app, I didn't put that I was going to be taking melatonin, okay? Because I was like, well, what if this is only going to work if they think I'm on melatonin? I'm on the good shit. I'm on that those trazzies. 
anyways, the trazodone didn't work. I'm like, and so then I take two more, uh, I have this stuff, it's called like a cortisol stress manager. Now, if, if you have any kind of hormone issues, uh, if you put on a lot of weight around your midsection, if you, you know, get cystic acne as an adult, if you have low egg count, most most PCOS shit, 10 times out of 10, it's because your cortisol's all fucked up. Well, I'm high, I'm running hot. So I take this stuff at night to kind of help cool down the hormones. I only take one of those pills. Dude, on this flight, I took two of those and I was still up itching. I don't know what the fuck has happened so I start panicking. We land in L.A., and at this point, I've been up for 24 hours. And then I got to get on a regular, you know, I'm in first class, but it's not a lay flat from L.A. to Atlanta. And we had two people from our country club sitting in front of us who wanted to chit-chat about golf. I said, I can't handle this. I cannot handle this. So by the time I got home, which was 7 p.m. Atlanta time, I had been up for like 36 hours, and I was delirious. So I go to bed the first night at like 8 p.m. I wake up at 3 a.m. I'm like, all right, this is the journey I'm going to be on. Next day, I wake up at 4 a.m. I went to bed at 11. I've worked full days. I'm wearing myself out. This morning, woke up 3.41. Couldn't go back to bed. Took my cortisol manager. Again, that's something you take at night to help you go night-night. I was up tweaking. So I'm making breakfast at 6.45 outside with the birds you know, and they're like, get the time shifter. I was like, get some, get some light, natural light. I'm standing next to my pool in the grass trying to do some grounding because they say grounding's good. You, you, you know, you stand in the grass with your bare feet touching the earth and that didn't do shit. So it is currently 12 o'clock right now in Atlanta. And I, I am afraid that when 3.30 hits, I am going to fucking crash. So I don't know what's about to happen in this next hour of this podcast, but I am hanging on for dear life. And I've had about six poppies this morning. Shout out to Poppy. I'm addicted to this shit, okay? I don't know what's in this. I don't know what's in this, but it's good. Mm. And good for you. So I am, I'm on another level. I'm on another level. But, you know, everybody texted me this morning. Taylor Swift says, jet lag is a choice. Is it? Is it, Taylor? When you're making a billion dollars a show, yeah, it's a choice. But I was over in Australia fighting for my life. I love Taylor Swift. And I know I said this on the last podcast, but I got to tell you, bitch stole my audience. Very upset about it. And then I couldn't even get tickets to the show. All right, let's talk about it. So the last day, Jeff and I had um, a Sunday, the Sunday that uh, Taylor was playing in Sydney. I had done shows in Brisbane. I did shows in Sydney, Brisbane, and then Melbourne. So we flew from Melbourne back to Sydney. Beautiful last night. We had the whole thing planned out, but I was like, Jeff, I'm really going to try and get Taylor tickets. Like, I really want to go. I've tried to explain this, and people kept sending me StubHub links, but there is no secondary sale market. We have StubHub. We have, you know, fan ticks, all this shit here in the States. It's, it's illegal over there. You know, they do everything, like, sort of sophisticated in Australia. It's very fair. So every day you could go on this one website, which was like, it was regulated, but it was a version of StubHub. And they would release new tickets. Well, there were no tickets. So everyone's DMing me, Heather, why don't you just email Tree Payne, who was Taylor's publicist? I don't know what's wrong with me, but I do not like to ask people for things. And it is always to my detriment. I mean, everybody on my team yells at, yells at me about it. They're like, just ask that person. These people always beg you to come on their podcast. Just ask if they'll come on your podcast. I'm like, well, I know they're busy. I don't want to ask. I'm going to start fucking asking for shit. But everybody was DMing me like Tree Payne, who is, uh, has been Taylor's very famous publicist forever. They're like, just email her. Email her. And I'm like, I can't. She doesn't know who the fuck I am. Taylor's not going to care. And then I got in this like big ball of self-doubt. So I was like, I'm just going to put it out into the ethosphere and the atmosphere that somebody's going to come through with a ticket. A fan from Australia had two tickets, but they were $1,200 a piece. And Jeff had the caucasity to tell me he's like twelve hundred dollars a piece so you're telling me twenty four hundred dollars for nosebleed seats when i have already booked us in a, a, an adventure to climb the sydney harbor bridge so then i got looped into that shit and if you don't think that that started an absolute marital spat actually shout out to my girlfriend taylor frost she had a friend jeff and i were walking to the bridge climb which I will tell that whole story in a second. We're walking to the bridge climb. We get in a fight. My girlfriend, Taylor Frost, who lives in L.A., her friend is sitting at a cafe, 
And, and, and where we stayed, we stayed at the Park Hyatt. It's like the best hotel in Sydney, right there across from the, the bridge is under, is right above us. You've got the, the opera house in the background. I mean, just stunning views. The cruise ships come in right there. It's the place to be. And I am walking at least 40 feet in front of Jeff, huffing it back to the hotel so I can put on a clean thong before we're about to take our lives on this fucking bridge. <laughs> my girlfriend Taylor sends me a photo of one of her friends who is sitting at a cafe and she's like Heather's huffing and puffing it's a horrible photo of me I've got seven chins okay my Prada bag is just glued to my fupa and I am sweating and Jeff looks pissed behind me all right so we already didn't and then Taylor sends me this photo I was like yeah I was screaming at Jeff I was pissed so we get to this Sydney bridge climb. Now, Ray had done the climb when we were in Sydney a week and a half before, but we could only get a reservation for, for this Sunday. So I'm already pissed. I'm already like, you know what? I do so much shit for Jeff. He should have thought to like surprise me with Taylor tickets, called my agents, figured it out, even though I'm sure they would have been like, fuck you, good luck. I'm like, I got this fucker master's tickets again for the 10th time. I just don't know why I, I thought there was going to be some like uh, grand gesture of surprise. All right. Meanwhile, everyone's like, email Tree Payne. I'm like, first of all, Tree Payne is not a real name. Okay. I'm sure I know that this woman is a redheaded badass bitch who has been running. Taylor's uh, uh, camp for years, but I was too nervous to email Tree Payne. I should have emailed her for tickets. So I'm already pissed. I'm pissed. I'm I'm upset with myself because I'm like, why am I being such a little pussy? Why don't I ask people for things? Why do I always feel like I'm imposing on people? That's some sort of, you know, deep layered therapy I got to work out. I'm pissed that Jeff signed me up for this fucking... <laughs> bridge climb which Ray told me it was going to be a breeze was it physically demanding a, a smidge okay it was a it was physically demanding a smidge and, and I will I will explain that in a moment but regardless it was fucking terrifying so I'm already huffing and puffing. I'm pissed at Jeff. I'm like, he only gets to do what he wants to do. We're going to his restaurant tonight. I'm sure I will enjoy it. But it's always about what Jeff wants to do. Like when my husband wants to do something, he gets tunnel vision about it. Like there is no, uh, there is no talking him out of it. There is no swaying him in a different direction. Where I'm like, go with the flow so hard sometimes. But I do all the planning. I, uh, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna spiral into our our issues. <laughs> Anyways, now, mind you, I want to say, Jeff and I had the most loving, fun, fantastic time together. We were together three and a half weeks abroad. We've never had so much fun together. It was a blast. Like, we don't ever get to do trips. You know, we needed that week in New Zealand, just the two of us. We live at home with my mom. We don't ever get to just sit in the quiet with the two of us. And I adore my husband. You know I adore him. We're, you know... He is a yin to my yang. I make him fun. He calms. He He's the rock. He's my rock. Like, we just had so much fun. And we had said so many times on the trip, he was just like, this has been such a blast. Like, we, we needed this time um, together. But on the last day, I'm fuming. You know what I mean? I am fuming. And I'm like, I'm going to be positive. I'm always so fucking positive that it makes me angry. So we show up to this Sydney Harbor Bridge experience. If you need to Google what this is, it is the bridge that is literally goes across the Sydney Harbor. All right. It's an iconic bridge. Oprah has fucking climbed this thing. When you walk into this place, it shows all the celebrities who have done it. Okay. Chef Jamie Oliver's done it. Hugh Jackman's done it. Uh uh, you know, who like every Selma Hayek's done it. Oprah and Gail. I'm like, oh, this is what dreams are made of. This is gonna be fine. Y'all, this was the most terrifying out-of-body experience I have ever had. They So when you go in, you have to like, you put on this jumpsuit, they hook you up into a harness, they do a, at least an hour of like safety briefing beforehand. And you have to practice climbing. There's like a mock setup of one of like, they call it like the toughest part of the bridge where you have to climb a ladder and um, go to this landing, then climb another ladder. And they're like, this will be the most physically strenuous part of the of the climb. And I'm like, oh, I got this. It's easy. It wasn't actually like physically taxing. I did not realize, though, that my fear of outdoor heights was going to absolutely cripple me about a th uh, 13 minutes into this fucking climb. But I'm like, I got this. Now, you're harnessed in. You are harnessed in. You have a cable that follows you the entire way. They, I don't think they've ever had in 20 years of doing this. Nobody's even like slipped. It's very, very safe. 
The scariest part is, though, so you start walking out under this bridge. So I want you to imagine the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, there's a pedestrian way. You start walking out, though, in a cat way, the catwalk, as they called it. Guys, it couldn't have been bigger than a foot. So you're walking one foot in front of the other under this catwalk the entire way of the bridge until you get to the part which is kind of like in the middle of the bridge where you start to go up. When I tell you, though, the guardrails on this bitch were yay high, okay? They were up to center calf. And I I know that I have a lot of mental health professionals that are listening to this. It's not that I have ever had the thought, like, I love my life. I'm very happy. This is not like I want to end it all. But sometimes, and I asked Jeff this after the after we climbed this, I said, Jeff, did you ever have intrusive thoughts about, like, what would happen if you just, like, jumped off? You know what I mean? Like, what if I just, you know, just did a little, little cat nap, little cat dive, if that makes no sense. A little, little jump, a little hop, skip, and a jump. Over the over the edge. He's like, Yeah, I think that's a natural instinct just to be like, what if? Never like I'm in a and I'm in a depressive state. I'm not suicidal. It was nothing like that. I just the whole time I was like, I'm on the top of a fucking bridge right now. I am being held in with a cable. I could sneeze in the wrong direction and fly off this bitch. It's more of that intrusive thought. Like, I am up here. What if I just wasn't up here? Do you know what I mean? So we get a quarter in. Now here's the thing. The average age of the people that were doing this this bridge climb with us were like 65 and when we did the mock um uh, the mock trial of like climbing up the heart uh what am I trying to say when we did the mock trial of what of what it was going to be like on the bridge this lady was in front of me she was older and I judged her I was like oh she's gonna move slow so I told Jeff whatever we do we want to be at the front of the pack we don't want to be behind the old folks because it's gonna take forever Right before we go out and start the catwalk, our phenomenal leader, Jack, said, hey, is anybody here a little nervous? I wasn't feeling nervous. It's like, I'm going to crush this. Ray said it wasn't scary. I'm going to crush this. It's going to be easy breezy. I'm so excited. And the two older ladies said, we're a little nervous. So Jack said, come with me. So they're heading, they're leading the pack. So Jeff and I are the last two in the back. We start walking across this catwalk and it immediately clicks in. I have a fear of outdoor heights. You know, I could have been on the show Fear Factor. You could cover me in rodents. You could make me eat a scorpion easy. All right. Put a little Hidden Valley Ranch on it and let's get to chomping. But you asked me to climb a fucking bridge in a harness with a wind factor of 100 knots an hour. And then I just thought that I was going to breeze into this. Dude, I go to start climbing. The catwalk's terrifying. And I'm like, I, I got to be positive. Jeff has been dreaming about this moment for years. I cannot let him down. He's behind me. He's my soldier. I know nothing's going to happen to me. Like, I was literally having to dig deep into a place of, like, pure, like, Tony Robbins-esque personal growth, uh, 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 personal um, like a, like a pep talk. I'm like, listen, you stupid little bitch, one foot in front of the other. They wouldn't ever put you on this thing if they thought that you could just fly off the top. I know we haven't even gotten to the latter portion yet, but do not let Jeff know that you are unhappy. Do not let Jeff know that you're scared. Do not let him see the weakness in your eyes. Then we start climbing up the ladder. Now, you're in kind of a grate, right? There's like a crate, uh, a cage around you. So even though it's really steep and scary and all the cars are whizzing by, because now you're at the second level of the bridge where the cars are going by you. So it's like zoom, zoom. You see the train go by. You're like, this is fucking terrifying. But at least you're enclosed. So the whole time I'm thinking, if I slip, I'm in a, I'm in a cage. You know what I mean? A Nissan Pathfinder isn't going to clip me. And then we get to the part where you're walking over the bridge. When I tell you, I, I, it was like a physical takeover. It, it was like I had a full body Charlie horse and I was just hanging onto the side and I was shaking. And Jeff's like, uh, are you good? He literally goes, are you good? Babe, babe, are you good? And I just turned around and my, because all my Botox is worn off, my jaw was just rattling. And I go, I forgot to tell you I'm afraid of heights. We've been together 13 years. I have never once told my husband, I don't like to be on the side of a mountain. He literally looked at me and he goes, you watch documentaries religiously about Everest. He said, it's literally on your vision board that you will summit Everest and you want to tell me now you're afraid of outdoor heights? 
He's like, too late, bitch. Now we get like you would you would climb the ladder, go to the next stop, and then this guy Jack, who is in front of us, right? So you're single file, one person in front of the other. Jack's at the front of the line. He's making sure everybody's getting through, and he would tell you history about the building of the Sydney Harbor Bridge and about Sydney and, and Australia in general. And it's really informative and cool. Jack sees me in a full body shake, gripping both sides of the railings. Okay, and he's like, Heather. Are you good? There's only like 10, there's 12 people in this group. And I just, you know, <laughs> I go, solid as a rock. I didn't know what to fucking say. Because the 70 year olds in front of me are just cruising. Everyone's got their hands up. They're like, wow, feel the breeze. Look at Sydney. I couldn't look to the, I couldn't look to the left. I couldn't look to the right. It was a full body takeover of fear. And I was having this Tony Robbins pep talk, like you stupid little dumb bitch. You think they're going to let your fat ass get up on this bridge and you're going to blow over. You think that you're so important that somehow you're going to have an intrusive thought that you're going to jump off this bitch and that you're going to make headline news. Oh, is it about you? Is it about you? Well, maybe you wouldn't be on this bridge though if your husband just got you Taylor Swift tickets. You could have worn one of your glitter suits to to the arena and been screaming with a bunch of other women who didn't come to your show because they wanted to go to Taylor instead. Yeah, you little bitch. Nobody even likes you in Australia. <laughs> like it was cyclical and weird and sick and just twisted. And I was having to literally like when like I started singing the little Wayne song, six foot, seven foot, eight foot, ten. Like I started singing that to myself so I could get through it. So Jack sees that I am in a full body tremor and I'm like, and I, you know me, I don't show weakness. Okay. I'm like, this is showtime. <laughs> but in my mind, I, I am just absolutely not realizing the physical takeover. It wasn't even mental at this point. It was like, I'm on top of a bridge. This is terrifying. The guardrail is to my mm, waist. And I am the only person on this, this, this trip right now who's scared. These young, probably 22-year-old girls in front of us are bouncing around. They're like, uh, arms up. And I am just clenching, just gripping on for dear life. So then Jeff keeps coming up to me, and he's trying to put, like, a finger in my butt. And he's like, you good? And I finally turned around. And I go, don't touch me. I'm not okay. Then it, it, it clicks with him that I'm actually about to have a nervous breakdown. I said, I'm fine. Just don't touch me. Do not touch me. I don't know if I'm going to projectile vomit. And in my mind, I'm just so embarrassed at how how this this uh, how much this affected me. And I'm also in the moment trying to be in the moment and like look out. But I had already been on a boat two days in a row, bitch, on the Sydney Harbor. Okay, I've seen the lay of the land. So now you're telling me I got to see the lay of the land just to get the fucking content on the top. Now, mind you, you can't bring a hair thing. You're everything has to be clipped onto you. So Emily, my social media gal, was like, Heather, bring the camera, get the content. I'm like, honey, they have a photographer at the top. I'm allowed one photo, and that's a wrap. I mean, you can't even bring a lip gloss. You had to take off all your jewelry. Like, you could not, because they can't have, you know, your wedding ring flying off the damn thing and it impales somebody at the bottom who's just on a, on a party boat, okay? So I, that's also going through my mind. I'm like, if I sneeze, my snot could could kill someone. I mean, it was just a, 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 um, a ninja blender of turmoil and feelings. So anyways, I, I'm already 24 minutes into this fucking story. So then we get to the part where you take photos. And the guy who's leading this, he's like, are you good? He's like, oh, no, you're panicking, aren't you? I said, Jack, I'm fine. I am a warrior bitch. I will fight through this, but I need you to know my body is shutting down. <laughs> so he's like, you ready for your photos? So we're in the back of the line. So I'm taking photos, peace sign. We're doing like gang symbols. I don't know. It was panic because you know that. Once the camera hits me, I come alive. Whether I'm on doing a show for 200 people, 6,000 people, or I'm on the top of the bridge having a panic attack, when that camera hit me, I think the only way I made it down was because there was a photo opportunity. I think that the the the, the sun was hitting me in the right direction. He, you know, Jack's like five, four, three, two, one, give me a pose, and I just fucking went into Zoolander mode. I mean, I was hitting the poses, hitting the shots. So then you're allowed to do like a quick video. 
So, of course, I'm like, well, fuck this. I'm at least going to do a plug for the rest of the tour dates. So I'm going to post that. And I'm like, I got the fucking content. Get your tickets at heatherontour.com. And I was just angry. So then we get to the part where we're past the photos and now you're working your way back down. You're still on the top of the bridge, okay? You go across the top and then you got to come back the other way. And then my boy Jack wants to stop on the other side and do a 45-minute uh, history lesson about the guy who built the bridge. And I was just, I had to put my head down. I, I, I didn't know where to look. And Jeff's like, he kept asking me like, are you good? Are you good? Jeff always gets annoyed with me when I ask him if he's okay. And he's like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Which when he's usually not fine. And that's what he was doing to me. It came from a loving place, but I turned around. And I'm like, I am not okay. Quit asking. And then I'm like, I don't want to ruin his experience. I'm trying to be positive. I was literally bearing so many emotions down in this like harnessed outfit. I mean, I, my, my vagina was so sweaty when I took this harness off just from the, sh like I was clinching. It was, it was a permanent Kegel for 90 fucking minutes on top of this bridge. So we get down and Jack, who's leading, leading this expedition, he was like, are you good? I said, Jack, I'm not okay. And you're a fucking asshole to have this as a permanent job. I said, how many times a day do you do this? He's like, well, I, I usually do three runs, but, you know, legally I'm only allowed to do three, but I'm pushing for four. I said, I don't know what kind of high you're chasing. I don't know what kind of family turmoil, childhood trauma you're trying to run from, but this is fucking nuts. Did we get great photos? We sure did. But we get down and we're in the locker room, like about to change, and Jeff grabs me. Now, m meanwhile, I still feel like I'm on top of the bridge. So I'm trying to kind of like get my bearings. It was a full adrenaline rush, and I didn't know if I was going to throw up, what was going to happen. And I'm literally like, okay, we're down. I'm smiling, and we're smiling, and everybody in the group is happy, so I'm smiling. But I just shit myself for an hour and a half on top of a bridge. <laughs> And Jeff comes up to me, he's like, he like shakes me to like, kind of like be like, we did it. And I, I, I had tears welling up in my eyes and I just said, please don't touch me. Well, then immediately Jeff thinks that I'm angry with him. Was I? I sure was. I was so mad. I could have been at Taylor Swift eating a fucking hot dog, drinking a Stella Artois in a glitter suit, singing Cruel Summer. But I wasn't. I wasn't. I had a fucking Charlie horse and both calves because my body was doing panicked tremors. So then we get done. Jack pulls me aside. He's like, you're a celebrity, right? I was like, yeah, no one here in this country knows who I am. But yeah, he's like, well, we'd love to put your video up. I said, you will absolutely put my video up that scrolls through so when people come they're like look heather mcmahon did the sydney bridge i said if you don't jack i will come back and i will fucking kick your ass the next time i'm here on tour so we had a good laugh and then we start walking back to the hotel this is our last night at, the, at this stunning hotel last night in australia and jeff's walking 200 feet in front of me he's huffing and puffing and i'm literally yelling so I'm sure there's more people, you know, the three people who knew who I was in Australia are taking photos. I'm like, do not diminish my experience. I am, I was positive the whole time through a panic attack. Do not make me feel bad because I didn't want you to give me a hug at the end. And he's feeling defeated. So we get back to the hotel. He goes upstairs. I immediately go to the bar. Okay. And I'm really not a person who tries to settle my feelings with alcohol but I immediately go to the fucking bar and I'm like garçon Aperol spritz I I chug two of those down now mean meanwhile I'm dripping in sweat okay you basically go naked underneath the suit I'm in my Lululemons everyone there is like this woman has just seen a ghost I chug two Aperol spritz and I go back upstairs I'm like we're gonna settle this now I, I said I was a trooper I wanted Taylor Swift tickets. We still did what you wanted to do, and that was very scary for me. And I smiled the whole time, even through a physical fucking char full-body Charlie horse. He's like, I just didn't realize you were afraid of outdoor heights. I was like, I didn't either. But I was having intrusive thoughts. <laughs> Okay, guys, and also the next, the last three days, I've had the sorest hamstrings, calves, toes, knuckles, just because my body, it was like, you know, when people say after they give birth, you're in that weird position and your whole body just hurts because it's like fight or flight. I have, I have been so sore 
from this whole experience. And it didn't dawn on me till like 24 hours ago. I was like, oh yeah, because I was gripping onto the side of a fucking bridge for an hour and a half. Was it a great experience? Sure. Would I do it again? Um, yeah, most likely for content. Sure. Because I'm a whore for content. Speaking of content, um, had the best fucking time at all the Australia shows. I got to thank everybody who came out. Um, you know, God keeps you humble with smaller crowds, but it was our first foray into the Aussie scene and the audiences were great. Uh, so much fun. I got to meet so many fun people, at the meet and greets. I just want all of my Australian fans to know, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And now that we have ripped that band aid, we have popped that cherry. We will be back sold out big theaters. We're going to do it up big. Um, it also did not help that I was still in this like pseudo fucking shadow band while I was over there and again you follow me you listen to me you can find me the, with the warming period as they call it what happens is my stuff doesn't get pushed to new followers so I'm doing all this press over there to push the shows and to get my name out I mean I'm doing national huge shows and then no one could find me so it was just really stressful on, on the PR side of it all. But listen, we had a great time. I mean, you know, we, we uh, the people who came to the shows, we had a fucking blast. We had an absolute blast. And I'm so grateful to all y'all who came out. And it was so, so great to like meet people and hug people who I've been DMing for years. And I will absolutely be back to that side of the world. I've never had so much fun. Um, so thank you for having me. That was a real blast. But, but it was wild. Um... Yeah, and y'all, I'm sorry about last week's episode. It was not my best material, but I was just so sweaty and nervous. I haven't performed a solo act in front of a really hot dude in a minute. So I want you to know, shout out to Jock. Shout out to Jock and then shout out to Jack, who is my uh, my bridge guy. Um, you know, we, we land, we get back, and it's right back into the chaos of being in Atlanta. Um, listen, I'm in such a privileged position to have my mom in my life. You know, I got one dead parent and I adore my mom. She's my buddy. But I came back and we walked into the house. We're redoing the laundry room. It should have been done by now. It's not done. You know how construction goes. They sent the wrong fridge. Then we didn't have tile. Then the guy with the cabinets, he's been on fucking sabbatical. So we thought we were coming home to a finished project. It wasn't. I mean, I I had, a, a, you know, I... I, I I know that that's how that goes, okay? Nothing is, there's never one, it doesn't even matter if you're, you know, retiling a bathroom. Nothing is ever on schedule. But we came back and it's like everything from the laundry room and the pantry is all on our giant island in the house. And my mom's, you know, been stir crazy three weeks by herself. So she wants, to, I, I walk in the door and she's immediately like, then one of the neighbors at the country club sent me this video. Do you know what's going on with the immigration in New York? And I was like, I cannot. I just came from this like utopic society of, of Australia and New Zealand where everyone's just nice and people are polite. And yes, of course, they have their problems, but I didn't see them. OK, I didn't see a problem. And it was just everyone was joyful. And I came back to just chaos. It was like I walked into the kitchen. We don't we have to go to a laundromat to do our laundry. Robin's been on the YouTubes that the crazy people in our neighborhood have been sending her. The thing is, too, with my mom, she is so uh, uh, social and fun. But it, it I, don't, I don't know how to say this without sounding like a total cunt. It's it's my responsibility some days to keep her entertained. And it's hard when you get to that age. You know, people don't invite my mom to dinners all the time unless it's like, you know, her three single girlfriends. If people are married, they are always like, well, I don't want Robin to be like the fifth wheel. Please let her be the fifth wheel. She'll fucking pay for dinner. And she probably won't, but, you know. So I, you know, was texting my mom and FaceTiming her every day, but I just feel like such a, not, I don't want to say it's not a burden because that's going to come out wrong. I feel such a, a weight of being like, I want to make sure my mom's, you know, feeling fulfilled. And she's so much fun when she travels and she's so bright and intelligent and fun. And sometimes when she just sits at our country club and you have all these like crazy cuckoos sitting around, she can like kind of like, you know, it's like she can get influenced by that. And I was like, mom, mom, we got to turn off the YouTubes. If Debbie sent you a fucking video, she's fucking nuts. She's an agoraphobic and hasn't come out of her house in like 20 fucking years. All right. Don't open the links from Deb. Don't open them. 
So now I'm on Ritz Carlton yachts. Listen, if anybody here works for Ritz Carlton, I need to take my mom on a Ritz Carlton cruise. Okay. I've been looking them up. They're all sold out. Can somebody get us a spot? I'm going to take her five nights in the Mediterranean in June. I feel like a cruise would be perfect, but it's small. It's intimate. She could meet people her age. She, she loves a cruise, but it's like small and fancy. I need to take her on something. So I, I you know, everything's sold out. I'm like, fuck, I'm trying to see if I can use points. I got the Marriott Bonvoy points, but these cruises are fucking expensive. And I'm like, it's peak season in Europe. I got to take her on a trip. And Jeff's like, you haven't even been in the house three hours and you're already panicking. I'm like, because she needs to get out. I got to get her out. I got to get her traveling. And everyone was like, why didn't your mom come to Australia? She's like, you need to go have a fun trip with you and Jeff. We never just get to do anything for ourselves. And anyways, though, I just am back and I'm like, okay, I'm fighting the jet lag. I know I got to take her to dinner. And I said, mom, I love you. I know I've been gone. I know you want me to wine and dine you and take you out and entertain you. I need 48 hours at home. I, my, my, my social tank is full. I, I, I have nothing left to give. But it's hard, dude. It is, it is hard. I feel, you know, I feel for her and I'm trying to coordinate some sort of trip where we do it well, like a pie cap pasta trip with people her age. You know, but it's like trying to figure out where that fits in the schedule and coordinating that. And and I'm, I probably should have just kept this to myself and not said anything on the podcast. But anybody out there who has a single parent left, I think you can empathize at least that there is there is a pressure. You know, and it's just me. It's just me running that show of taking her out and doing things. I'm an action steps person, and I adore my mom. And the thought of her sitting at home on a Friday night, and I and I track her, and I see she's running up to Ross for less three times because she's bored. It breaks my soul. And it was my dad's birthday on February twentieth. Shout out to Pisces season. I will say, okay, let me backtrack. I had a full blown, also nervous breakdown at the Australia Zoo. First of all, the zoos in Australia are gorgeous and stunning, and they're more like conservations and and uh, sanctuaries, if you will. So we get the hookup at the Australian Zoo, which is near Brisbane. Everyone's like, oh my God, Taylor Swift's at the zoo the same time as you. No, 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 no. She was down at the Sydney Zoo. We were a two-hour flight north. The Australia Zoo is the home of the Irwins. If you don't know who Steve Irv- Irwin was, is, rest in peace. He was, uh, he, he coined the term, crikey. He was the original animal renegade, okay? He was a icon in the world of educating uh, people about animals. He was known as like the crocodile hunter. That's what he did. He was almost like a medium, like he would chit-chat with the crocs. This whole zoo is his baby. He died, I think, about 15 years ago. He, I mean, and if it's if you're younger listening, Google who he was. He was an icon, still is, like the most famous person to con- come out of Australia. So he has this insane zoo. And when I say, like, it's not the zoos that we see in the States, it's not, you know, you got 400 animals packed into three square blocks of downtown Cincinnati. That's not what it is. It's You're on this acres and acres of land, and these animals can roam, and they take amazing care of them. I was really impressed with the work they did. So we get tickets to the, it's called the Crocosseum, all right? And it's this big auditorium, outdoor amphitheater, if you will. And they're like, hey, just so you know, the Irwins are going to do the Croc show today. I'm like, fuck yeah. Turns out it was Steve Irwin's birthday. So you got Bindi, who's the daughter. Is it Robert? Wait, fuck, what's the son's name? Hold on, I'm panicking. He's so hot. I think it's Robert Irwin. Robert Irwin. Then you got the mom. Bindi's is married to this guy who's now also in the animal biz. So they come out. I mean, this this crocatorium is packed, all right, in the blazing heat. And we're about to see the whole Bert, the whole Irwin crew wrestle a croc. Now they don't actually wrestle him. They just feed him and teach you, and it's like very kosher and 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 it's you know very humane for the animals. So they play a video with Steve Irwin. I'm hot. I'm tired. I just got to hold a koala 20 minutes before that. Like I am, I am on a very uh, a loving, emotional ride, roller coaster, if you will. They play a video of Steve Irwin, and then his wife comes out and his kids come out, and they're like, "Today would have been my dad's 62nd birthday," and it would have been the day prior on February 20th was my would have been my dad's 66th birthday. <laughs> Y'all, I am sitting in the crocatorium. 
eating these chicken flavored chips that are all over Australia, drinking a Coke Zero, and I start sobbing. I don't know why I was so emo on this trip. I'm not pregnant. I was just like, I love this. This is beautiful. Look at them carrying on the legacy of their father. And Ray's like, are you good? I'm like, no, I'm not okay. And I just was so emotionally moved. First of all, the whole family's so good looking. And if you didn't know, Bindi Irwin won Dancing with the Stars. She's a fucking legend. Multifaceted, triple threat. Not only can she throw a dead rat at a crocodile and educate you on saltwater safety, but she can also do the tango. I mean, these people are do are inspirational. So I'm weeping. They're, they've got birds flying everywhere. They got the crocodile coming out. They're teaching you how to not get bit. You got Robert Irwin in the water splashing with the croc. It's a beautiful moment. They're playing videos of Steve. And, you know, and I'm just thinking, what a cool moment for the, this family. And everybody, of course, around us, like, I can't believe the Irwins are doing the show. Like, this is a big deal. You came on the perfect day. And I'm just like, yeah, fuck yeah, we did. My dad's dead. <laughs> And everyone's like, why is this random American woman who is just housing these chicken flavored chips and a Coke Zero hysterically crying while the sun is beating down on me? Also, there's no ozone layer in Australia. So I've, I'm covered in zinc. It's melting onto my Spanx dress. I mean, I look like a fucking disaster. It was such a beautiful moment, though. And I, I don't know. I feel like it was a little bit of a whisper from my dad because I think uh, I, I had, you know, my dad's birthday. I had a I had a moment. I had a silent moment on the beach. And I just said, Dad, I love you. I miss you. Send me a sign that you're with me. And I think that meltdown at the crocodorium. I think that was my dad being like, you stupid bitch. You want to have a laugh? We're going to have a laugh. Um. But I, and of course I DM'd all the Irwins, have not gotten a response. I'm like, this is the best zoo ever, Robert Irwin. So come to find out, he's on the cover of like Ladies Magazine in Australia. He, dude, he's hot. He's only like 20. He is so hot. And Bendy's running the show. What I loved about Bendy Irwin is she has her husband. I think his name's, no, the Croc, the Croc's name was Chandler. Bendy Irwin's, hold on, uh, husband. Her husband's name is Chandler? Yeah. Oh, Graham. Graham was the name of the crocodile. Gra you know, these crocodiles live to be like 100 years old. Graham was Steve Irwin's personal croc. That's his buddy. Chandler is the name of Bindi Irwin's husband. Hottie. Totally my type. So Bindi and him, they're they're like, they've got, you know, the mics. They've got the Britney Spears mic on. They're throwing, you know, Bindi just literally sticks her hand in a bucket, has a dead rat, and throws it at the crocodile. And it's like, I've got a baby at home. And I'm just like, what the fuck is happening? Their baby's name is Grace. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. Chandler, her husband's also in the water with uh, her brother, Robert, and everyone's splashed in the croc. I'm like, this is a family fucking biz, okay? I was just, my heart was full. I'm also like, can you imagine? I, I've got it. We got to get Bindi on the, on the podcast because I want to interview you hurt like you know is that one of those things when you sit down for a first date and she's like oh okay so like what are you into I was on Dancing with the Stars would you ever get in, in salt water with a crocodile you know what I mean like clearly her dad was a badass so she's not gonna go date some guy named you know Trevor who works at a bank if she's gonna get hot and horny it's got to be for a guy who's willing to get in the water with a crocodile so I'm just like, my mind is racing. I'm watching Chandler. I'm thinking, who's watching baby Grace? What happened if Chandler loses an arm because he's throwing a dead cat carcass at the... <laughs> Not a cat carcass, you know what I mean? Like a chicken at, at this, at Graham. And Graham is such a tender name for a crocodile. You know, maybe call him killer. Maybe call him, you know, uh, like, like uh, you know, one tooth, Tony, something. And everyone, and then Chandler to get him back. Okay, so in the Crocodile, and there's this giant saltwater pool, and the, you know he Graham swims in, and they do all this lesson, and they're feeding him, and they're doing all the shit, and then they got to get him to follow somebody through the river back to his like big oasis. He has this huge, you know, saltwater. I think crocodiles are in saltwater. Regardless, he has this huge conservation. So then Chandler, Bindi's husband, gets in the water and is like, 
come on, Graham. And Chandler's American. He's like, come on, Graham. And just start swimming. And they show it on the screen. And I'm fucking, I mean, at this point, I am literally have my mouth over the bag, like dry heaving into this bag of chicken chips. Just like, because <sighs> I'm, I'm thinking about baby Grace. You know, we've already lost Steve Irwin. He didn't, he didn't die from a crocodile thing. He actually was stung multiple times in the heart by a stingray shooting a show, Deadliest Animals. It's fucked up story. And, you know, obviously these people are professionals, but I was just deep breathing into this bag of chicken chips, just like, this is it. We're never going to see Chandler again. He hops out of the water. Graham goes right back into his pen. And the crowd goes wild. And I am just sitting here sobbing, being like, I miss my dad. God, I did not expect the Australia Zoo to be that emotional. We did hold a koala. It was a very cool experience. And also, for some of my animal lovers who are concerned about that whole situation, you have to, I mean, it is it is very regulated. Um, they're only, you're only like three people a day are allowed to hold the, the animals. We got, you know, I did. I, I didn't have the balls to email the publicist tree pain to get Taylor Swift tickets but if you, you bet your ass I, I I got in on the PR list at the Australia Zoo I literally emailed them huge American comedian only in Brisbane for 24 hours would love to hold a call <laughs> they got me in but um Kiana was this great girl who taught us everything about the koalas and here's the thing koalas look cuddly but they're not the kind of animals they're not snuggle animals I you know you had to be very regulated with how you held the koala I was crying the whole time during that because that's been a dream of mine my husband and I do this really cheesy thing I'm embarrassed I'm even sharing this he always says koala and then he comes around and like hugs my neck so I Jeff was also back in Melbourne playing golf so he missed the entire Gold Coast trip for four days, and he's just like, what are you doing? I sent him a photo. I'm like, I know you're teeing off. I see you're on the 13th tee box, but I'm with the koalas. Um, so I was crying at that. I, you know, I learned a lot. They've got really big teeth. They sleep 20, like 20 hours a day and eat for four. I said, this is my fucking animal. But right now, I'm the opposite. I'm sleeping for four. I'm eating for 20. I'm, I don't know what the fuck is going on with my circadian rhythm my anxiety I, we got a lot of shit going on you know I was supposed to do voicemails and I will do voicemails <clears throat> but we're already at, uh, at 50 minutes but I got a lot to talk about I I am very excited and very honored to be a part of the Garden of Laughs um, event on M March 27th at Madison Square Garden you guys this is so fucking wild I put on my vision board this year that I want to play Madison Square Garden and I'm playing the theater there with some with some of my favorite comedians of all time. And when we got the call, I was like, wow, this is really wild. I just put on my vision board, I want to play MSG. And we 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 are going to play MSG. We are gonna play the we're gonna play the fucking garden. We are gonna do it. But um this really cool event is called Garden of Laughs, and you're in New York in the tri-state area. Get your tickets. Um, so it's a benefit for a charity. Um, that Madison Square Garden is a part of. And, dude, it's going to be Jim Gaffigan, John Stewart, Michael Che, Sam Morrell, Bill fucking Burr, Tracy Morgan, Krista Stefano, and me. They asked me to perform. I'm shitting a brick. I texted my stylist, Sonia. I go, outfit, outfit inspo, slut. Like, I got to show up you know, in the words of Marvelous Miss Maisel, I got to show up tits out, tits up. And I know Chris Stefano. Um, did I miss Michael Che? Michael Che's doing it. I don't know if I said him. Like, guys, I am losing my shit. These are these are men in the biz that I have. I love. I've loved them. I'm obsessed with. I mean, look, dude, Bill Burr, Bill Burr. I saw Bill Burr and I played Tampa a year ago the same week. He was playing the arena. I was playing the Tampa Theater. And I saw we were staying in the same hotel. And I texted my agent. I was like, dude, because I think we're at the same agency. And I was like, I really want to say hi. But again, I don't ever want to inconvenience anybody. I don't. And I know that that's an issue. I'm a people pleaser. And I wanted to tell him what a big fan I was. And then when we were driving to the theater, I see him just walking down the main drag in Tampa holding a pizza. <laughs> Just kind of like staring one foot in front of the other, looking sad. And I was like, that's the only way I want to see Bill Burr out in, out in the world. And I hope I'll share that with him. But he's one of my favorite comedians.
So I'm just really honored to get to be a part of it. I'm also the only female in the lineup, which is really wild. So I know that this is going to be a very heavy male audience. So my girls, my gays who are listening to this, please come out. It's all going to charity. It's going to be at the theater at Madison Square Garden on March 27th. I am so freaking excited. And... um. I, this is just cool. You know, I know Chris Stefano. I've done his podcast. He's an angel baby. He's so funny. I adore him. But I don't know these other guys. They don't know me. And I do feel like there is a large responsibility and, and a pressure to really fucking make these guys howl. I know my show's great. I love what I do. I know I'm here for a reason. But I am like, none of these guys know me. So I got to show up and either they just stare at my tits or they're like, she's really fucking funny. And I'm hoping it's the latter. So I've been a little anxious about that. You know, you always dream about having a seat at the table, and I've had a seat at the table at my own fucking table. I've been doing it my own way. So um, to be able to have an opportunity to perform with some of some people that I've just really looked up to in the biz, I'm very excited. So please get your tickets for that. It's one night only. It all goes to charity. It's going to be a wild night, and you get to see some of the best comedians ever, period, in the game, and you get to see my huge jugs and slutty top out there um and i need the support because i am so nervous about that um also a little update on life i here's the wild thing there's so much great stuff happening and last year was like the biggest year of my career period but i don't know why this year i have felt so anxious and almost stagnant i think the shadow ban in a weird dumb fucking way made me feel like i wasn't getting this instant gratification from like the, the views and the people and nobody can find me on instagram and i was just feeling like, that, that's so fucking stupid but unfortunately in this business that is that is the only thing that that helps you feel like you're moving the needle. It's not. I sell sell out shows. Like we're about to play Kentucky this weekend. It's sold out. It's going to be fucking epic. But I was really kind of feeling stagnant. And I know that I'm feeling stagnant because of this TV show. And I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say. I'm not trying to stir the pot. I'm not trying to get myself in trouble or anybody else. I've just been getting a ton of DMs. Heather, what's going on with the show at NBC? What's going on? You know as much as I do. It's very frustrating. I thought I was going to get some good news while I was overseas because anytime I've sell, sold a TV show before, I've always been out of the country. So I told my uh, writing partner, Jen, I was like, Jen, this is going to be great. I'm going to go to Australia. I'm going to do these shows, have this new experience. We're going to get the phone call that the show's greenlit. Just to also uh, explain to y'all, I had a show at Peacock. They didn't pick that up. But then they were like, we want to do a new deal with you at NBC. So I've been in the NBC Universal family. I love them. I mean, I've told y'all this before. If I were to ever get a tattoo, it would be the, the NBC Peacock. That's how much I've dreamed of as a kid being in the NBC family. So now we're waiting to, you know, and you get eight agents calling about this. We just haven't heard anything. And I know they're in the middle of pickups and they're trying to figure out, you know, stuff that was left over from last year during the strike that, you know, other people had deals. So they're trying to figure all that out. <clears throat> Hold on. I need a poppy break. So anyways, that's where we're at. But it, I felt very stagnant. I can't get a yes. I can't get a no. They're like, the show's alive. It's not dead. But here's the thing. What happens is you have a team of people who are like producers that develop the show with you at the network. And then once they sign off on that script, it then gets sent up the ranks. So there's like three other people that have to read this script. Well, every day it's like, hey, I'm, I'm changing names. Hey, has Cheryl read it? Yeah, Cheryl's read it. Okay, now we're going to send it to Clark. Clark's read it. But we don't know if they're going to send it to the very top because if Clark doesn't like it, he's not sending it to Jamie. And then we find out that fucking Cheryl hasn't even read it. Well, Cheryl's a fan of mine. So I'm on the phone with the agents. I go, somebody, I know that like their job is to manage my expectations, but I'm a transparent bitch. I was just fighting for my life on the Sydney Bridge. I just held a koala. Could have mauled my face off at any moment. I was in the Crocosseum. Three inches away from either choking on a chicken chip or getting bit by Graham. And I can't get an answer from NBC? <laughs> get it together. So I was in a meeting yesterday with my team and I was like, somebody just get me a yes or a fucking no. Because I'm feeling crazy. I've got other shows that I want to sell and take out. Just give me a yes or no. And I think that's what's so hard about this business. And of course I did like 55 fucking self-tape auditions. I don't think I do well on self-tape. I think I do better if I'm in a room because I can charm the shit out of you and you can give me a note and I'll take it and run with it. So I'm doing self-tapes in New Zealand. The only time I really take a solid vacation with my husband and he and I are fighting in the room over like the lighting. And I'm like, you're not reading. You're not reading the lines with enough emphasis. And he's like, I thought the whole point of me reading this with you is that I, I stay neutral and let you shine. 
shine. I'm like, I will always shine, Jeff. I always fucking shine. <laughs> and then we have hot, wild sex, and then we go eat oysters. You know what I mean? It's a vicious cycle. So I'm auditioning for all these shows. I haven't heard back. And I was just feeling really weird. Like, the, like I've been on a hamster wheel. We're moving forward, but I'm right now just moving in the same space. And then this Garden of Lassing, Laughs opportunity came up, and I was like, all right, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. But it is, it's hard. I'm auditioning. I'm not hearing anything. The show, I, I don't have a yes or no for you yet. So Cheryl's got to read it, then send it to Clark, and then... You know, and then his boss has to read it. I, I I don't know what to tell you, but that's the inside of the inside. And I've got other friends who are getting greenlit and their shows are getting picked up and I'm at my wit's end. So please send positive thoughts and, and prayers and just all the good things. Listen, just give me a fucking pilot. If you let me shoot the pilot, I'll show up and it'll be fucking great. And you'll see I'm a star. That's where I'm at. You know what I mean? That's why touring's great. Because if I can put asses in seats, fuck, even if I didn't put ass, is in, asses in seats, I can get out on the corner of Fifth and Lex with a, with a, a mic and I could do sh some shows. You know, my comedy the entire career I built myself. And I, it's very frustrating to wait for somebody else to give you a yes. But I've had to learn patience. And you know they say, when God closes one door, he will open a window right into a sad comedy club. <laughs> but we love it. I love it. I, lo I love stand up because I, nobody, I can do whatever the fuck I want, which is a beautiful thing. All right. Um, I'm going to be on the Oscars next week. Now, I'm not going to be at the Oscars. Well, I might attend the Oscars. I'm going to be back on the E Red carpet. I'm working the fashion panel this time, which is very exciting. So I'm going to be chit chatting about all things fashion, um, which is awesome. I'm, I'm so grateful that they had me back. Cannot wait to be out there rubbing elbows, you know, um, with the cast of Barbie and Oppenheimer. You know, it's just going to be me talking about science. So very excited about that. So please tune in and always let E know, you know, if you like me or not. And if you don't, <laughs> don't get me shadow banned. All right, we have time. We're going to do like two voicemails. I'm sorry, I've been rambling. There was just so much to catch you up on. And let's see. Let's get into these. As always, you can call in 800-213-7503. I love listening to y'all. And it's always unhinged. Let's get into it. Hey, Heather. Lexi here from Melbourne, Australia. Lexi. Just wanted to call in with an absolutely not. So I recently went away on holiday with my family up to Noosa, which I know you recently went to, and had an amazing time. It was my birthday. We went out for lunch. We had fun by the pool, went for a swim, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, on the last day, I was like, I'm going to treat myself. I'm going to go surfing and just have a bit of me time. So I did that, completely forgot to wear my hat mm. and absolutely burnt my scalp to a crisp. Yeah. And, oh, my God, it was very painful. So, you know, hating life. Anyway, that brings me two weeks later, up to date to today. I'm at work. I look at myself in the mirror in the lift and I notice that my scalp is fully peeling. Mm. And when I say that, I mean like I've got a thumb size nail chunk mm. of my scalp yeah. just sitting on top of my head. Absolutely not. So I look like I have crippling dandruff. So I'm like ugh, hating life. But anyway, absolutely not to having no ozone layer in Australia yeah. and looking like you have dandruff at work and having to quickly run to the bathroom and just like scoop that out. Anyway, absolutely loved you. Loved your show in Melbourne. Please come back to Australia. We love you and can't wait to see you again. All the best. Love you. Bye. Lexi, thank you for calling into the podcast. And it was so lovely meeting you at the show. Um, th like I said, no ozone layer on that side of the world. So you see all these tan Aussies, but they're wearing full zinc. Okay, you are fighting for your life. That When I say, like the first day we went out on a walk, Chris got so fried he had bubbles. And we were only out for like an hour. And when I met up with him and Jeff at the beach, Chris's shoulders were red and I, I put some sunscreen on him, but I didn't think it was going to be a full body flush. He got bubbles. My husband, who hasn't worn sunscreen since 87, literally got the back of his neck fried. So, you you know, it's not, you can't go to Australia and lay out at the beach. People do, but then everywhere you go, there are these skin clinics everywhere, like dermatologists on every square inch of this fucking country. So, uh, Lexi, I'm I'm sorry you got the scalp burn. You should have known better as an Aussie. But let me tell you what, there was nothing wilder 
every young white girl in uh, the United States who ever went on a Royal Caribbean cruise went to Labadee Island, which was on the island of Haiti, but like not the scary part. And it's a private island and they'd have all these Haitian women lined up to give you braids. And, oh, so, sorry, play that again. If you weren't, th- you know, 10 years old on a, on a cruise on a private island getting your hair cornrowed with beads, you weren't fucking doing cruising right as a kid. All right, that was my favorite thing. And what would my mom always forget to do? Line me up with that beach bum right in the crevices. So what would happen day three of this fucking cruise? I would literally have seven degree burns. Oh, fuck. I'd have seven degree burns on the fucking scalp. And then I have to go back to school, which you're trying to show up and brag you were on a cruise. You know, oh, where'd you guys go for spring break? Oh, your lake house? I was in Haiti. (laughs) You know what I mean? I was in Haiti getting cornrows, bitch. And then I would just shake the beads because you would walk into like fifth grade and you just shake the beads down the hallway because you wanted people know that you were coming. You wanted them to know you had entered the fucking building just on how loud those beads were from your Royal Caribbean vacation. And you would show up and you wouldn't know because you're like eight years old, but your entire scalp, the skin had bubbled and boiled and it's peeling. And then everyone's just like, ew, Heather's got flakes on her sweatshirt. And you're like, shut the fuck up, Danny. Shut the fuck up. But it was true. And you just sit there during social studies like a crackhead, just peeling your skin off. Thank, shout out to Anne Marie, one of my oldest friends. She would always take the time to peel my skin. And I want you to know, if you ever run into me in the streets, maybe I'm doing a show in Florida and you got a bad sunburn, I will easily, I would love, I always have tweezers in my purse. I will peel that skin all day long, okay? My husband says I'm a sick fuck. I said I like attention to detail. Um, so everybody on our trip had some sort of pustule bubble at some point and I I learned the smart way I mean I'm a gal who likes to tan when I go to Italy I get dark you know what I mean I've got Italian blood but I'm I'm Irish facing I'm I am Irish forward Italian back does that make sense so I can get tan after two weeks but I'm also starting to realize I'm aging I got to get my neck done I was googling upper bluff up plasty where they basically you know I got hooded eyes but they they cut your eye in half and then they you know scale it back I'm like do I need that shit I can't get in to see Dr. Nelson he's booked going on vacation I said I'm doing the Oscars and I got lines but I don't trust anybody else so I'm going to Nelson I'm feeling old I'm feeling old I see the comments on the the interwebs I know my eyelash strips falling off right now there's nothing I can do so I'm probably gonna look fucking cross-eyed this entire video we're all fighting for our life out here. I get it. But I've, I've, I've been, I think because I've been stagnant of not knowing what's going on with this TV show and I was really hoping to like know what my year was going to look like, that then I start sitting in front of the mirror and nitpicking my physical flaws. And that's a very dirty, vicious game to play. And I'm like, I got to get this. Should I get under eye fill? You know what I mean? I'm definitely getting the neck done at 40. And I'm going to tell you this right now. I will go get my neck done and I will be on Instagram stories that night. I know that's tacky and taboo, but I, I, you know, what would Joan Rivers do? She would go do shows with her face wrapped. Always do content to then get shadow banned. Um, You know, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I'm going to get that tightened up. I want to get that tightened up. But I have been doing that. My husband's like, you're being very hard on yourself. I'm like, well, I'm not getting an answer. I'm not getting an answer from NBC. So I got to go get plastic surgery. He's like, you can't do plastic surgery, Heather. And then when they call you to pick up your show and you're like, I'm out for nine months because my eyes are falling off. Like, that's, that's not how it works. But when I'm not getting a yes, I start to then look inward and then I can get very uh, mean to myself, which is so stupid. And also, I've said this before, uh, you know, uh, a comparison is a thief of joy. Seeing everybody else get their shit picked up. Well, that's great. Good for them. I'm doing my own thing. But it does make you get crazy. And then I'm like, my arms are starting to look a little soft. You know what I mean? Can I get my armpits lipoed? Like I'm, I'm unhinged over here. So I want y'all to know if you're feeling stagnant or if you're feeling weird or you're starting to like self-loathe a little bit, it's that time of year. We're all in it. But we are also in Pisces season. Turning 37, I'm realizing I got to shit or get off the pot with a child and all this shit. And now there's the fucking thing in Alabama with the IVF. I mean, fuck us. 
I don't even want to end the podcast on a negative note, but this shit is for the fucking birds. So I'm, you know, emailing my my IVF folks here in Atlanta, and they're like, you know, clench your asshole. I got one daughter on ice. I don't know if I'm going to go to jail for it. I mean, it's fucking crazy. If I can say anything, because I'm fired up right now, if I can say anything right now, fucking vote blue, all right? I mean, for God's sakes. I know, listen, I believe the Illuminati is as real as the next person, but I'm fucking voting so that I can have birth control and then I can do IVF and some, you know, Mitch McConnell just threw, said he's retiring in August. I'm like, I'm gonna fucking, I'm angry. You know, the poor women of Alabama now don't know what the fuck's gonna happen with their shit. Uh, I'm, I can't even use words right now to um, articulate what I'm exactly mad about. I'm just very fired up. You know, the wild thing was, too, in Australia, they're f- fairly conservative over there. And everybody would corner me. What's going on with the, uh, the election? Are you not terrified about Trump? And I'm like, we're terrified about everything. We're terrified about everything. We're terrified, period. But if you're a woman... And you're still somehow sucked into this like level of misogyny that Trump's going to be your savior. Savior, he's not. He does not care about you. And I know the economy is important. I know all those things are important. He does not care about you. Republicans do not care about you. I was a registered Republican for many years of my life until I learned better. So these people don't care about us. And that's all I'm going to say. Okay, great. Let's get to one last voicemail. <laughs> you know who cares about you? I do. I care about you. Let's get to one last voicemail. Hey, Heather. It's Haley from Philly. And I've got an absolutely not for you. Mm. Absolutely not to your buddy inviting you to be a bridesmaid in her wedding by telling you you're fat. Yeah, you heard me right. So... A buddy of mine recently hit me up, and she says, hey, I've got something to tell you, but don't freak out. So immediately, of course, I respond, and I say, are you pregnant? And she laughed it off, and she said, no, I want you to be a bridesmaid in my wedding. And I said, well, why would I freak out about that? What are you talking about? And she responded back, and she said, well, I just didn't want you to freak out about how much weight you have to lose before the wedding. <gasps> Ma'am, are you serious? So it was a quick one-two punch because that was only punch number one. Punch number two, unsolicited, she sends me a bunch of pictures of her potential wedding dress at a try-on with our other two best friends. And I had not been invited at all. And no no qualifier, no message to say, hey, by the way, like, there were only a few people allowed at the appointment, or I was in the area where this other friend lived, so, of course, it made sense to take her. Nothing. Just unsolicited photos of all the group without me and in your wedding dresses right after you call me a heifer. So that's big absolutely not for me. I also don't know how to address this because, frankly, my mouth was hanging open, clatching flies because I didn't even, I couldn't believe. I was gobsmacked. This is one of the best voicemails we have ever had. This is going to be a longer episode because I'm about to just, I'm about to get dialed in. This is one of the best voicemails I've ever heard, period. Clear, concise, one-two punch. I love it. First of all, I am so fucking sorry that this cunt of a whore is, has asked you to be in her wedding. Also, this bride is stupid because if you know anything, you always ask your friends who are heavier than you to be bridesmaids because then you look extra fucking thin on your wedding. Takes the pressure off the bride to lose that extra 15 if everybody around you's got an extra 25. I mean, that's just, that's, that's math. That's how numbers work, okay? Everybody knows that. Hold on. So not only, who is this bitch? Send me your address. We ride at dawn. That's fucking insane. I don't want you to be stressed. I want you to be in my wedding, but I don't want you to be stressed about how much weight you have to lose. Oh my God. (laughs) 
Honestly, that's something one of my country friends would do. First of all, you uh, you don't want to be in this woman's wedding. You need to you need to bow out. You need tell her you're pregnant. Be like, you know what? I'm going to be able to come to the wedding, but I am pregnant, and just and 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 just string her along. String her along. I don't care if the wedding's a year away. Tell her you're already pregnant, and just be like, hey, you know, I you're right. I am feeling too heavy. I will also be very heavy because I'll be nine months pregnant at the wedding. Like I just don't want to. Um, and just then never, uh, you know, produce a baby. Just let's just fuck with her back. Um, I hate this woman. I don't know who she is. Her name is probably Kelsey. I hate her. I hate her so much. If I saw her in a Trader Joe's, I'd choke her out. I'm not saying violence is the way, but I hate this woman. But also, she should know better. You don't ask anybody to lose weight at your wedding except yourself. Would you, would, you know, wire that jaw shut. Let everybody pork up around you. She should be fe- sending you Chick-fil-A coupons saying, lunch is on me, babes. Hope everybody puts on an extra 45 so at the wedding, she looks f- slim as anything. And then on top of that, she sends you videos of her trying on dresses with your other BFFs. Well, guess what? They're not your friends. And I'm not trying to stir the pot because I am a sucker for keeping people around far too long than they need to be around. But this is done. We're drawing the line in the sand now. Who are these other dumb bitches? Okay, if it's Tiff and Trish, well, you better call them and say, why wasn't I involved? Why did nobody let me know? This is 10 minutes down the street from me. It's done. It's a wrap. Oh, my God. But also, thank God, you know, count your blessings. Thank God you didn't have to go to a fucking dress try-on with this nightmare of a human. I went and did my own dress try-on initially because I didn't want, again, I didn't want to bother anybody. I've got to work through this. I, if somebody is a therapist and is listening to this episode, please don't call a hospital and put me on a 5150 hold. But please let me know what, what this issue is of mine. You know, I, I, I got bounced from my therapist because she was too busy. Shout out to my friend Amy Mallon who set me up with her therapist who I loved. But then she was, I couldn't get on the books. I was like, I'm not, first of all, I'm not famous enough to get Taylor Swift tickets. And I'm definitely not famous enough to, to have a therapist want to talk to me. I thought at least she'd want to like get the gossip because I'm in the public eye and then maybe email Dumois with my family issues. But she didn't. She's like, no, I got to talk to like regular folks about their narcissistic mothers. I'm like, okay, fine. Well, I'm playing Radio City in a week and I'm nervous. <laughs> She's like, let me go fix other people's problems. Dude. Dude. I hate I hate everything about this wedding. Don't, you need to come up with some crazy fucking excuse. I think you tell her you're right. I am going to be really fat because I'm going to be nine months pregnant. Also, um. You know, I've got the heart murmur. Come up with some shit. Make this woman think that you are a ticking time bomb of a walking heart attack going into her wedding. She's not going to want the liability. You're not going to the wedding. You're not in the wedding. You're not going to the wedding. You're done. Tell Tiff and Trish, we out. It's a wrap. You need to bow out. Say you're planning heart surgery that day. Come up with something, bitch, because I'm not allowing you to be in this toxic environment. Let her think you're pregnant. And then just be like, never produce a baby. And then get on Ozempic just to prove her wrong. And then you know what you do? You fucking do something. No, I don't do that. I'm not saying that you need to change anything about yourself because you're a gorgeous, stunning, fabulous, bad bitch. But it would be pretty funny if you ended up getting like gastric bypass and then you show up just like fucking, like a whittled windpipe, just slim. And you wore white. And you're like, yeah, who's got back fat now, bitch? <laughs> but no, don't change anything about who you are because this woman sounds horrifically toxic, insecure, and I hope that her wedding catches fire. Um, all right, listen, thank you for calling in with one of the best voicemails ever. I'm I'm burning. I'm I'm angry. I'm gonna get off this voice uh, this podcast. I'm gonna call some agents and say, what the fuck's going on? I don't know. I might. I'm going to do something. I'm probably going to go eat a taco because I can smell it and I am starving. But I want y'all to know that even if you feel like you're on the hamster wheel of you're just you're just rolling around and you feel stagnant and you're not moving in the right direction, you're not getting the answers that you want, you don't know what your next move is, just put one foot in front of the other. Work begets work. Keep moving in the right direction. Be nice to yourself because we're all too mean to ourselves. And get your tickets to heatherontour.com. I love you. I mean it. This was a great episode. I hope you had a good time too. And I'll see you on the next episode. Arrivederci. Ciao, Bella.
Bye, guys.